Prototypes are not something that you need to know for modern JavaScript, but they definitely open a world of possibilities if you want to do some low-level programming or take a look behind the scenes of the magic of modern JavaScript. At its core, we have the secret proto member. We create an object called alpha that has a very simple name property pointing to the string John. So of course, type of alpha.name will be string, but in addition to name, it has a few other properties as well. For example, it has a do string, which is of a type function. So the question is, where are these things defined? And the answer is that when we created this object, it got a special property called proto, which itself is an object. And that object has the do string property that we are looking at. When we access a property off of a value, the JavaScript runtime first looks at the object. For example, that is what is happening with alpha.name. And if it doesn't find it over there, then it looks at the proto. And that is what is happening with alpha.toString. So we can actually create an object called beta and provide a proto ourselves. And if we point the proto to alpha, then in addition to the properties that we defined on beta, for example, age, it gets the properties that we defined on alpha as well, for example, name. And we can actually prove that the name property is coming from alpha because when we modify alpha.name to be Jane and try to read the name property from beta, then we will get Jane. We can actually create a whole proto chain and when we look up a member, JavaScript sees if that object has that member and if not, it transparently travels through the proto chain till it finds something that has that member or the proto becomes null. So let's do something crazy and create a person that is an object that has a proto of a proto of a proto that points to an object that has the member's name and age. And if we try to access person.name, JavaScript travels up the chain till it finds something that has it and the same for the age property, it travels up and finds the age 18. But if we try to access a property that does not exist anywhere in the proto chain, for example, weight, then JavaScript gives us that special value that we've talked about called undefined. And what's really happening behind the scenes is that JavaScript has looked at person.proto.proto.proto till proto itself became null and at that point gave up and gave us undefined. And the first time you see it, it can be a bit hard to believe. So let's just run this code to prove that this is how JavaScript functions. Not to be confused with the instance proto, there is a special property called prototype that exists on classes and functions. And spoiler alert, classes are just fancy functions. So we've been using this property underscore underscore proto underscore underscore, which we've been calling proto, but the JavaScript language specification actually calls this proto concept as prototype square bracketed. But we will call it proto because calling it prototype gets confusing because there is an actual property that exists on functions called prototype. Let's create a very simple class called alpha that has a method log. What might surprise you is that the type of alpha is actually going to be function. And functions have a special property called prototype, which is an object. And any methods that we define on the class actually get defined as functions on the class prototype. So classes are actually just glorified functions. And we can actually achieve the same effect with the function within JavaScript. And this is what people used to do before we actually got classes. We define a simple function called beta. Of course, it is going to be of a type function, just like the class. And it is going to have the prototype property just like the class. Additionally, any methods that we want on the class, we can actually just add to the prototype of the function. As far as the JavaScript runtime is concerned, the class alpha and the function beta are actually equivalent. We've talked about how the new operator impacts this during object creation. One more thing that the new operator does is that it assigns the function prototype to the created instances proto. Let's create a local variable that will help us see some of the effects of new. We create a simple class called new effects. And within the constructor, we take a message property, which we add to this. And additionally, we save the this value into the created variable. We also add a simple log method that logs the message that we previously saved. Now, when we create a new instance of the class by using the new operator, what happens is that JavaScript creates a new object and passes it to the constructor by using the this keyword. And this created object is what is eventually returned from the constructor, which we are storing in the instance variable. So whatever was this within the constructor, which we stored using created is exactly equal to the instance that is returned. So that is the main effect of the new operator, but it does something more. Note that the instance is only going to have one property, which is going to be message, which we set in the constructor. Yet we can actually use instance.log. We know that class methods are actually defined as properties on the function prototype. So new effects.prototype.log will be that method. So how does it end up on instance? 
And the answer to this mystery is another effect of the new operator, which is that it takes the function prototype and assigns it to the created instances proto. And since the log method is defined on the prototype, it's going to be available on instance.proto. And as we know, when we access a property, JavaScript magically looks up the proto till it finds it. And that is how instance.log just works. At the heart of a lot of magical features of JavaScript is the transparent assignment of a well-known prototype to the proto of the created value. We know that functions come with prototypes and the new operator assigns the prototype of the function to the created instance's proto. And since classes are just glorified functions, that is exactly what happens for the class as well. But what might surprise you is that a proto assignment also happens for primitive types. As an example, when we create a string, the created value has a proto member that points to the well-known string.prototype. And similar prototypes exist for other primitives as well. For example, with a number, the created values proto is going to point to number.prototype. And this is how these JavaScript primitives actually get their built-in methods. The number prototype has a member called toPrecision, which is a function. And because the prototype gets assigned to the proto, it magically shows up on the created numbers proto. And therefore, when we do number.toPrecision, it's really using the toPrecision method that is actually defined on the number prototype. Because prototypes exist for the primitive types within JavaScript, it makes it super easy to add newer features of JavaScript to older JavaScript runtimes. And that is how polyfills work. Let's say a new JavaScript spec has come out, which means that all JavaScript strings now get this magical method called uppercase trim. Even without updating our JavaScript runtime, we can actually polyfill that method into our existing runtime by simply defining it on the string prototype. The only simple trick that we have to use over here is that instead of taking the string as a parameter, we use the this keyword, which we saw in its own dedicated lesson. By using this keyword, the string will automatically get passed in as this based on the string that is used to invoke the method. Now we know that every single time someone creates the string, it gets the magical proto property, which points to string.prototype, which means that any created string has access to the uppercase trim because that is what we defined on the string prototype. So if we call uppercase trim on a string with spaces at the edges, that is all in lowercase, the spaces at the edges get trimmed and the string turns to uppercase. Needless to say, you shouldn't modify the built-in prototypes unless you are creating a polyfill because you will end up with conflicts. Instead, just create a utility function. It's easier to create without making a mistake and much easier to understand at the point of usage for the next person. Here's a little known fact. JavaScript class inheritance with the extends keyword actually also works by utilizing protogening. So we create a simple class animal with the method eat and we create a simple class bird that extends animal and adds another method called fly. When we create an instance of the bird by using the new operator, we already understand how the fly method will end up on the instance. The way it works is that the new operator assigns the prototype to the proto. And since the prototype has the fly method, it is going to be available on the bird proto, which means that bird.fly just works. What we haven't explained yet is how does bird.eat work? And the answer to this mystery is that the extend keyword actually creates a proto chain between the two prototypes and assigns the prototype of the base class as the proto on the prototype of the child class. So if something is not found on the bird prototype, it will automatically be looked up from the animal prototype. And since the bird class prototype becomes a proto on the instance, methods defined on the animal prototype will magically become available on the bird instance. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we can just do bird.eat, all thanks to the proto chaining done by the extends keyword. We've been using the secret proto property, but there is actually a low level API that allows you to create simple prototype based inheritance. Let's create a simple animal that has the property eat, which is a function that returns yum yum. We can actually create a bird that inherits all of these properties by assigning the proto property to animal and then adding anything else that we want. For example, fly, flap, flap. And now we can do bird.eat as well as bird.fly. Using underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore is actually not something that is officially standardized. And we've just been abusing it as it is a pretty known secret. The official recommendation is to actually assign the prototype by using object.create. So object.create actually creates a new object and sets the proto to whatever is provided. So bird will be an object that has its proto member pointing to animal. So all that is left for us to do is to assign anything else that we want for the bird, which is just the fly method, flap flap. 
And this is equivalent to what we did before. We have the bird with the proto pointing to animal and the fly method added. And we can prove that by simply eating yum yum and flying flap flap. Using a null value for a proto actually allows you to completely opt out of the default object prototype assignment. And this is great when you want complete control over what properties should show up on an object. Let's create a simple object that we intend to use as the dictionary data structure used to track who came to our party and who didn't. As an example, John came, so that is true, and Jane didn't come, so that is false. But as we know, dictionary also has its proto assigned to the object or prototype. And since object or prototype has a number of things, for example, the toString function, it seems that toString is also present in dictionary, so it seems that toString also went to the party. What would be great is if we could create an object that didn't have anything other than what we wanted, not even proto, and that is exactly what object.create does with a null value. It creates an object that doesn't even have the proto property. So when we say that John came to the party and Jane didn't come, John and Jane are the only things that are in the dictionary. That two string or anything else within the object prototype is not going to pollute our nice clean object. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and some insights into how JavaScript actually works under the hood. As always, thank you for joining me and I will see you in the next one.